With all the news from WTCN-TV's expanded news-gathering facility. WTCN-TV, Channel 11. This is Channel 11 News at 10. Spectacular. This is spectacular. We have to breathe thousands of feet in the air. Friday, July 18th. A chilling sight in the afternoon skies. There are flash fires on all the uh, high tension wires. A powerful tornado does a dance of destruction across five Twin Cities suburbs. Another touchdown, another touchdown. Even more amazing, these historic pictures broadcast live from Sky 11. I'm going to have to leave this area here. The debris is drifting my way. Never before has anyone captured so clearly the force of this twisting menace. Good evening. Welcome to Unheard Sirens. We call our special that for one reason. Because so many people ignored Friday's warning sirens in favor of a mesmerizing display in the skies. In addition to showing you what must be the most photographed, most watched tornado in the world, we will remind you of what should be done when the warnings sound. But we begin tonight with a second look at the riveting pictures from Sky 11. The twister tore through like a giant egg beater, its 200 mile an hour plus winds ripping up the earth for more than half an hour at all. The sight of its unleashed power defies description. The pictures tell the story. A little later in the program, a special segment for VCR owners, a chance to record the historic site, man. It is indeed remarkable that the damage done wasn't far worse, that no lives were lost. We have a team report tonight on just what did suffer from the twister and how people are rebuilding. The Springbrook Nature Center, once a place of quiet beauty, is now a place of disturbing beauty. Its mighty oaks felled by something even mightier. The damage is surveyed daily. Half of the 127 acres were damaged Friday. Five to 10,000 trees badly battered or destroyed. What cleanup will take place won't be easy. But most of the destruction will stay as is. Nature took its course here, and this is, after all, a nature center. Nature's power is still being felt in another damaged area. Alan Cosentini has that story. The ANR trucking terminal in Fridley was just a day away from its grand opening when the tornado walked over its fence, tore off part of the roof, flipped a trailer, and ripped off 30 doors. Jerry Waldorf thought the twister had spared them when it suddenly hit the new building. And the only reason I watched it that long was because I had a safe place to go. Emergency crews have already repaired the doors and roof. The fence is being replaced. Only the gouges on the pavement from the trailer remain as evidence of the tornado's power. This was the worst structural damage from the tornado, but there was other damage, as Kirsten Lindquist reports. The building and rebuilding go on side by side at the Edinburgh housing development in northern Brooklyn Park. Houses that weren't completely finished now bear battle scars from Friday's nightmare, shattered windows and tattered roofs. Cindy Kuhar and her youngest child watch as workers try to put together what nature wrenched apart. And, uh, we, st we stood in the parking lot for about 40 minutes and watched it go over the development. Knowing and that it was coming. <laughs> Tearing us apart, yeah. <laughs> Measured in dollars, the tornado chalked up half a million in damage in northern Brooklyn Park, but that's all. Measured in human terms, it took no toll. And for that, people here are grateful. Kirsten Lindquist, News 11. Many of the homes in Edinburgh were not yet occupied. An unintentional lucky break during the tornado's path through the area. 
Another amazing thing about the tornado is that so many people saw it. Thousands watched it on TV. But thousands more watched from their yards or stopped their cars to scan the skies in awe. And that makes it even more incredible no one was killed. Paul Douglas joins us now with more on that and how people should have been running for cover. Paul? Well, Paul, Diana, Minnesotans as a rule are extremely weather-wise, and much of what you're about to hear and see is probably common knowledge. First, we have a warning. This is a perfect example of what not to do when a tornado approaches. Get in. Really coming in across now. Let's get in. Come on. Come right straight forward. Wait a minute, Tiny. We're going to wait. Come on. We got to get downstairs. Not yet. Many people risked their lives last Friday, taking home movies of the weather monster hovering over their backyards. In Brooklyn Park, curious spectators crowded onto a shopping center parking lot to get a closer look. Just trying to get the handle on right now. There we go. Make things a little bit easier. This footage was shot through a living room window. Hey, James. Did it Did it yeah. Did you get sound on this? You bet. It must be stated emphatically that all of these people were endangering themselves unnecessarily. They were literally tempting fate. The next time, if there is a next time, they may not be so lucky. The average Minnesota tornado, if there is such a thing, has a path length of three miles and 200 mile an hour plus winds, but affects a very tiny percentage of the viewing area. Most injuries are from flying glass. 200 mile an hour winds can turn any window into deadly shrapnel. When a tornado warning is issued, you should avoid not only windows, but cars, auditoriums, and gymnasiums. Mobile homes are particularly vulnerable. If you live in a mobile home, there should be a designated shelter you can go to when the sirens blow. The safest place? Your basement, under the stairs, under a heavy table if possible. If you don't have a basement, a small windowless room near the center of the house on the ground floor offers the greatest protection. That's also true of office buildings. Avoid windows at all cost. And remember, the smaller the room and the more walls between you and the tornado, the better. In schools, students should follow their teacher's instructions. Crouching down next to lockers in an interior hallway usually offers the best possible protection. Outside, move away from the tornado at right angles. If a shelter can't be reached in time, get out of your vehicle and crawl into a ditch beside the road. With planning, occasional drills, and a little common sense, you can avoid becoming a tornado statistic. Coming up live via satellite from Oklahoma City, a interview with Don Burgess. He's a scientist and a professional tornado chaser. And Paul and Diana, he'll tell us uh, what scientists can learn from Friday's spectacular tornado sighting. All right, we'll get back Thanks, to you in just Paul. a moment. Unheard sirens will continue in just a moment. And we'll meet the man who first confirmed Friday's twister. Please stay with us. What we know about tornadoes is thanks in part to scientists known as storm chasers, meteorologists who gather data by putting themselves and their equipment directly in the path of the twisters. We showed you how they worked last year on News 11 when Paul Douglas and photographer Bob Derlin tagged along with professional storm chasers over some 4,000 miles of Oklahoma. And they scored a coup on the very last day of their trip as their equipment recorded valuable data from the midst of a tornado. One tornado expert on that team was Don Burgess, a Doppler radar specialist who spent years studying twisters. And Paul Douglas is over in the Weather Center, joined by Don Burgess via Skylink 11 from Oklahoma City. Diana, Paul, I want to point out right off the top, I'm not going to try to kid you, I am not a tornado expert, but with us this evening is somebody who is. Don has analyzed, dissected hundreds of tornadoes, trying to figure out what makes them tick. Don, thank you for uh, joining us this evening live from Oklahoma City. We sure appreciate it. I'm glad to be talking to you, Paul. We've only given you 36 hours to analyze this video. I get a paycheck from Channel 11. I was obviously biased, but very impressed with the video. I want your candid, unbiased opinion of, of what you saw on the tape. Well, we're, we're very excited about it. It's spectacular video. Uh, it's a perspective that we just haven't seen before, and we just have not been able to see that detail in tornadoes, apart from trying to construct models of them, uh, until we got this video. Now, Don, what do scientists hope to learn from studying footage? I know you're able to track debris and estimate wind speeds. What do you hope to learn from Friday's tornado outbreak? Well, we'd like to learn about the detail of the tornado. We have such a close view that we can examine the fine scales that heretofore we just haven't been able to handle. But I must also tell you it's quite a challenge because 
Anyone who's seen that video or saw that tornado knows how complicated and complex some of the processes are that are taking place. Don, two brief questions here. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I want to ask okay. two important things. What gave it its whitish appearance, first off? And a lot of folks complain that they did not hear the telltale roar of the tornado as it approached. Why? Well, first, the reddish color, I think, just uh, is from the soil there and some of the vegetation, some of the tree leaves and, and uh, needle, pine needles and so forth that were being ingested into the tornado. But now the sound, the sound is kind of a fickle thing in a tornado. Sound waves can be attenuated by strong winds. So whether or not you hear the roar of a tornado depends whether the winds around the tornado are blowing in such a manner to let the sound waves pass or to extinguish them. The tornado can come close to you and you don't hear the roar all the time. I see. Don Burgess, we hope you can use the videotape to learn more about tornadoes and hopefully make them easier to predict in the years to come. And we want to thank you for joining us live from Oklahoma City this evening. Thank you. We're very happy to have the video. Okay. Paul, Diana, back to you. All right, Paul. Thank you very Paul. much. Well, Friday's Twister adds some credence to the theory that a tornado alley exists in the metro area. We called on meteorologist Andre Bernier, who forecasts for Northwest Airlines, in addition to working for News 11. To check that out, he begins a team report. Lake Minnetonka, a quiet and pleasant spot most of the time. But when severe weather crops up, it seems as though a giant magnet gets turned on and pulls most of the severe weather through here. Is there a reason for this geographical favoritism, or is it just a statistical glitch? History indicates that a majority of the tornadoes have favored a path from Carver County to Anoka County, north and west of the cities. Cases in point, the Fridley Tornado of 1965, a family of storms that killed 16 people. The Edina to Roseville Tornado of 1981, a multi-million dollar storm that left one dead. And the St. Anthony Tornado that tore up Apache Plaza and severely damaged dozens of homes. Rainfall amounts also seem to run higher in these very same paths during the summer months. And this makes sense. Where you find tornadoes, you usually find heavy rain. Several theories for the pattern include wind currents along our major rivers and the heat dome that develops over the metro on a hot summer day. Weather conditions that Friday were ripe for the display for Mother Nature's power. Temperatures were in the 90s, dew points in the high 70s, about as high as it gets here. The unstable air rose and produced a growing thunderstorm in northwest Hennepin County, which began to rotate. And much like the whirlpool in a bathtub drain, the tornado formed on the thunderstorm's southwest side, adding yet one more tornado to the collection in the Twin Cities Tornado Alley. We still need more studies to find out whether this phenomenon is fact or fluke. But one thing is for certain, tornadoes form quickly. And that makes it difficult for the warnings to be issued in a timely fashion. News 11 meteorologist Sally Patrick now has more on the people who put those words of warning out last Friday. I could see the uh, funnel touching down and the debris being pulled up in it at that time. When Brooklyn Park police officer Larry Ekman walked out of headquarters and saw the tornado Friday, he set off a series of events that officially warned the Twin Cities. Officer Ekman was the official confirmation of the twister, and he also became a tornado chaser, watching it move to the east. I could see uh, a lot of, uh, looked like two by fours, wood uh, shingles and things like that going up in the debris. When Officer Ekman first saw the tornado, he radioed Hennepin County to confirm it. The time, 4.47 p.m. There is the tornado right about there. This is the cell producing the tornado. Currently, Max News 11 meteorologist Paul Douglas is on the air moments later, relaying the information about the sighting. Information we picked up on police scanners. Information that came straight from Officer Ekman. And since the tornado popped up so quickly, that's how the National Weather Service found out about it, too. Police scanners. The twister formed so fast that radar didn't have a chance to pick it up. A little later on in this program, we'll be speaking with National Weather Service meteorologist John Graff about that and more. Paul and Diana. Still to come, we'll meet the man some call Mad Max. One of those responsible for last Friday's dramatic pictures of the tornado. Please stay with us. My first thought, there really wasn't any because it was so fast. And then it was scary. It was, everybody was shaking.
The incredible pictures of Friday's tornado would not have been possible without Sky 11 pilot Max Mesmer and news photographer Tom Empey. And their accomplishment has tossed them into the local celebrity limelight. Max and Tom were guests on KSTP Talk Radio this week, just one of their many invitations to satisfy viewers' curiosity. What becomes clear from what Tom and Max have to say is that they were in full control of the situation at all times. Their own safety came first. They knew Sky 11 could outrun the storm if things became treacherous. Still, there's no doubt there was an element of danger involved in the cat and mouse game Max played with Friday's tornado. Max describes his flight as a calculated risk, a risk he was prepared to take for what he calls the opportunity of a lifetime. In last night's Aquatennial Torchlight Parade, adulation from Max and his machine. Cheers for a fantastic flight. You gotta be dumber than we are. There's a certain element of risk involved in most anything, but I stayed with what I thought was a safe distance away, and uh, but still close enough to uh, get some great pictures. For Max, the office is a Bell Jet Ranger 3. More than half of his 49 years have been spent flying. His 17,000 hours in the air include two tours of duty in Vietnam. He admits flying for a television station at times can be tame. Quite frankly, I got to the point where, you know, I asked myself, uh, this is really my line of work because uh, it does tend to get boring at times, but uh, uh, I think I have a different outlook on the job after last Friday because it, uh, it obviously can be exciting. And Friday's game of tornado helicopter hopscotch has launched Max from dark obscurity to a limelight he's finding fun. NBC Nightly News. What is remarkable about this is that we can see it so well. Photograph from a helicopter piloted by Max Mesmer. Enjoy it while it lasts because it won't be that long. <laughs> He is enjoying it, too. Max has received a lot of mail, a lot of phone calls. Mm -hmm. This is from a young fellow, Billy Wurtonen, who's uh, six years old. He lives out in Plymouth. You can see Max in the helicopter here. There's Paul Douglas warning everybody. There's a tornado, a down tree. And Billy's learned a lesson. Here's Billy in his house hiding underneath a piece of heavy furniture right there. So he knows what to do. And those are all the things that we talked about last mm -hmm, Friday yeah. night. Very perceptive young man. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Billy. Mm -hmm. Well, frightening though it may have been, Friday's tornado can teach us some valuable lessons. Like the one Billy learned. That's right. Paul Douglas is joined now by National Weather Service meteorologist John Graff with more on that. Paul? Paul and Diana, as it turns out, Billy was one of the smart ones. It wasn't so much, John, a case of unheard sirens. The sirens worked perfectly. It True. was more a case of ignored or unheeded sirens on the parts of hundreds of people, I'm sure rational, sane, intelligent people, who left their basements, went outside into their front lawns, took pictures, gawked at this thing for half an hour. Uh, what do you think of that? That isn't right. We know that, uh, Paul. The uh, essential fact is this. The tornado was moving at only about one quarter of the normal speed of a tornado. It appeared to be stationary. You heard many people saying, I think we'll go to our shelter, and all of a sudden they said, no, we will use uh, less sane judgment than this, and they were going to go ahead and look at the tornado itself and look at it with that perspective. And what has really happened is that an incorrect lesson has been learned. Everyone who were able to observe that tornado, and perhaps the younger children who will go up with this, say, well, I was out with my parents. I remember we stood there, and they're going to remember that. The lesson we like to recall, although we don't want to go through another Fridley, mm -hmm. is the fact that you go to the shelter, you heed all of these warnings, had that picked up speed at that time, they wouldn't have been as fortunate as the helicopter pilot who could get away real quickly. That's a good point. They would have been caught had that turned and picked up speed, and they'd been known to do so. So a lesson has been learned that is not a good one. Things developed explosively in just a matter of eight, nine minutes Friday afternoon. That's very w true. Were you happy with the way things worked in general? What would you like to see during the next tornado outbreak? Oh, fine. What we would like to see is keep them just as slow as that, Paul, so we can work with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, but the key really is the fact that uh, we had sense in the fact that it was developing very, very rapidly. The communications people, the communications people as far as public TV worked very nicely. We were pleased with that. 
They were pleased with the fact that all of those who were in direct path of the tornado did take uh, heed to those particular warnings. And in the next time when this happens, we hope everyone realizes the fact that these rules must be observed. Okay, John, thank you for joining us. Paul Dana, sure. despite the promise of Doppler, there really is no substitute for first-hand observation, Skywarn observers, law enforcement out on the field. And uh, next time we hope we're ready and we hope people will really heed those warnings next time around. Okay. An excellent point. Thank, thank you both very much. much. Thank you. Well, start your VCRs rolling in a few seconds. Our next segment will give you a chance to record the best of the tornado video. It looked just like a regular whirlwind. And then the farther it got up towards this direction, it uh, all hell blew loose. There are many people who deserve a great deal of thanks for helping put together the coverage we were able to bring you last Friday. And there's one who deserves special attention. He's proud father and photographer Tom Empey, the talented young man who shot the historic tape of the tornado. His son Jacob was born just seven weeks ago, and Tom admits one of his first thoughts while shooting that day was of his wife Jerry and son Jacob. Tom's been with us at News 11 for a little over a year, and it would be an understatement to say we're glad to have him here and proud of him. Yeah, we want to show you right now, this is the lens that Tom took those pictures with. It's called a gyro zoom lens. And uh, for you camera buffs at home, you people that know about photography, this is a 6,300 millimeter lens. It gets a very tight picture from a very far, a great distance. When you're up in a helicopter, you're bouncing around like this. What happens in here, the lens is stabilized, so you can focus far off, far off, and this stabilizes the picture so you can go into a very tight picture and it's very steady. It's adaptable to all of our cameras here at News 11. It just attaches to the cameras right here, but primarily we use it up in the helicopter mm -hmm. so that we get uh, good looking pictures. And uh, by the way, it's worth about fourteen thousand so dollars. No, no, no. Make you you respond. hang on to we'll it. We'll put it in Tom Ryder's <laughs> chair. Then is what we'll do. We'll just set it over here for now. Then we'll get rid of that. And now we're going to come through on our promise. So get your VCR machine going. Tom Infy has put together several minutes of the best of the Twisters video. So get ready for the ride of your life. This is spectacular. We have debris thousands of feet in the air. There are flash fires on all the uh, high tension wires. We're about three quarters of a mile from the actual touchdown at this time. In the basement! You can hear the roar. It sounds like a freight train. ripping entire pine trees into the air thousands of feet.
Well, it was definitely a dramatic 33 minutes, a spectacular sight like uh, no other. But before we go, we'd like to urge you to remember the safety tips we gave you tonight and to leave the tornado watching to the pros with the experience and the equipment to deal with twisters. We'd also like to thank many people tonight, but if we thanked everyone who deserved it, we'd be here till the wee, all, wee hours of the morning, but uh, I guess we're going to do our best here. That's right, and remember, please, that the next time a tornado approaches, take cover. Thanks for joining us. Good night.